It's the nature of society and people that all great movements of social liberation have their flakier and strident fringes. The women's movement from Seneca Falls through the suffragettes and the right to vote through the 1960s also had a fringe of humorless radical separatists and writers coming up with such confronting notions as all men are rapists. The civil rights movement, from the Emancipation Proclamation to Frederick Douglass to Booker T. Washington visiting the White House to the soaring oratory of Martin Luther King and the writing of James Baldwin, also had some dubious fringe elements, such as beret-wearing militant Black Panthers. It shouldn't be such a contentious idea that the latest and possibly the last of these huge social narratives, trans rights, should be overwhelmingly positive in its pursuit of equality, understanding and visibility, but also have some fringe elements that are grating. I broadly support and have a huge amount of empathy for trans people who face dispiriting rates of suicidal ideation and self-harm during the journey to living their true identity, and they are deserving of dignity. However, in the case of the trans rights movement, there is a failure to differentiate between two things. The cause, trans people finding empowerment and tolerance, and the language, messaging and ideology that is being used to express the cause, and which is placing disproportionate and jarring expectations on the vast majority, to make allowances and adapt on a vast scale touching almost all of society. The ideologues and support of the trans community are not only requiring acceptance of new language and paradigms with which to frame their identity, they are also pushing for adjustments of the language with which the mass generality ought to be characterized. The vast generality is now cisgender, a new term invented and imposed in order to eradicate the marginalizing idea of normal and otherness. It is a little presumptuous, though, given that the trans community is a micro percentage of the population, and there's no need to construct a binary like that, reconfiguring everything. Sometimes the generality is just the generality. It is also entirely reasonable for those within the overwhelming generality to be incredulous of an NHS trust using gender-inclusive language for its maternity services, including terms such as chest-feeding and birthing parent, or referring to women as birthing people or people who menstruate. A UK-based transgender campaigner concerned about the rights of other vulnerable groups has said, trying to control the language of others does transgender people no favours at all. Quote, we should be living in society, not imposing upon it. Where these ideologues have gone wrong is that they have failed to recognise a shift in the culture. They have always assumed that the general majority of civilised, enlightened, liberal, and mostly mainstream people have been and will continue to be overwhelmingly on their side, and will indulge most of their notions. More broadly, however, we may be seeing a tipping point slightly away from the assumptions of these ideologues. It began with J.K. Rowling, who received an immense backlash to her reputation that encompassed most of liberal and even independent or non-political people. This seemed a powerful marker that what could be viewed as intolerance or a reactionary position would be shot down by a powerful, broad-based coalition of society. But gradually, things have begun to change. It began quite quietly when a large group of British figures from intellectual and cultural life signed a letter in a prominent newspaper stating that Rowling had been treated viciously and unfairly. This included Booker Prize-winning author Ian McEwan, described at the height of his career as an unrivaled literary giant, and Tom Stoppard, perhaps the greatest playwright of his generation. Then there was Dave Chappelle, who expressed his views, making the distinction between loving and accepting the people, and some of the excesses of language and ideology that has come with the cause. I am not saying that to say that trans women aren't women. Tellingly, when Netflix staff staged a protest, the higher-ups responded by suggesting that if workers weren't willing to tolerate a diversity of opinions and tones, then perhaps Netflix wasn't the workplace for them. Chappelle also made a welcome appearance at the Mark Twain Prize for his friend John Stewart, illustrating that far from being on the fringes, Chappelle remained steadfastly in the cultural mainstream. I won this prize two years ago, and I'm imagining, John, that this is a surreal experience. I imagine you probably didn't even give a till last night. 
Next, Ricky Gervais and his latest comedy special also took a satirical stab at the excesses and contradictions of trans ideology. Oh, women. Uh, not all women. I, I mean the old-fashioned ones. You know, the old-fashioned women. Oh, God. You know, the ones with wombs. Oh. This was a critical development, because unlike Rowling or Chappelle, Gervais didn't take much criticism and was able to go on promoting his special even on mainstream, risk-averse television such as major US network morning shows. This showed that contentious comedy looking at such contradictions in the ideology was able to withstand what had once been an activist juggernaut. Therefore, we are quite possibly at a tipping point because the ideologues promoting not just trans visibility and equality, but new constructs of gender politics now have, in order to stick to their guns, to maintain that the most popular and successful author of her generation, J.K. Rowling, one of the greatest writers of his generation, Ian McEwan, possibly the greatest playwright of his generation, Tom Stoppard, heralded by many as the greatest comedian of his generation, Dave Chappelle, and one of the most beloved writers, actors, comedians, and cultural icons of his generation, Ricky Gervais, are all not sufficiently enlightened. Either they have to say that, or they have to concede the simple point made at the beginning, which is that every narrative of social liberation will have some flakier and strident excesses, that it is incumbent upon the movement itself to act to reroute or moderate. The failure to do so, to be intellectually decisive, savvy, and active in this way, is a failure within modern liberalism. When it comes to high-performance sport, that other battleground in the culture wars, there are two reasonable arguments. One is that transgender people have the right to compete at the highest level, and that case has been bolstered recently, most notably with the international swimming body gathering together a coalition of trans representatives and athletes, medical and physiological specialists, and scientists, to work cohesively and systematically to come up with a set of criteria for trans athletes to meet in order to compete on a level playing field, involving testosterone levels and the adoption of a regimen of puberty blockers by a certain age, and other steps. By taking out the emotion and ideology, and focusing purely on physiognomy, this seems like a strong step in the right direction. On the other hand, it's important to respect the intense desire of non-trans athletes to make sure that playing field is actually level. An elite level rower, for example, from high school onward, expends years of their life in preparation for one shot at winning on the world stage. In many cases, this will involve sacrificing relationships, a profitable career, an active social life, and mean living in a habitual state of dense fatigue. And anyone who has seen the Olympics knows that these life-defining races often come down to 0.1 of a second. The sophistication of doctors, scientists, geneticists, and other specialists to do with biology and physiognomy is undoubtedly impressive. But the question will remain. Are their methods and criteria enough to level the playing field right down to that 0.1 of a second? And if, to losing athletes, that 0.1 of a second is as consequential as a minute or a day, then as long as doctors and geneticists are unable to refine their criteria down to that 0.1 of a second, it can never definitively be claimed there is an actual level playing field. In the coming years, scientific and medical approaches may in fact reach such a refinement, where the differences are virtually negligible. In the meantime, reasonable adults, including those in support of trans rights and acceptance more generally, are entitled to misgivings. At its heart, the debate needs to evolve to one that recognizes trans people and ensures their safety, visibility, and acceptance but modulates the excesses of the ideology that has barged its way too presumptively into culture and society. The signs are there that we are finally heading towards that ideal balance.